In this video I'm going to introduce Big O Notation, which is something every developer should understand. Because if you don't understand it, then you can end up writing really inefficient functions that take a long time to compute, or take up lots of space in memory. So Big O means big picture, looking at the worst case scenario of an algorithm. So if we increase the size of the inputs to a function, how much longer is that function going to take to compute? Or how much more space in memory is going to be required? And usually we're more concerned with time than space in memory. I think it'll be easier to understand if I now show you some examples. So here's a function called times2 that takes a whole number as an argument and then just returns 2 times that number. So if we pass in 5, then it'll return 2 times 5, which is 10. And if we pass in 2000, it'll return 2 times 2000, which is 4000. Now, which of these do you think will take the longest to compute? 2 times 5 or 2 times 2000? What do you reckon? Now, you wouldn't have been stupid to have guessed 2 times 2000 takes longer than 2 times 5, but you'd be wrong, because in JavaScript, both take the same. It's just one operation, one multiplication. 20 times 2 billion takes just as long as 2 times 3. So no matter what number we input into this function, it takes the same amount of time to compute. The algorithm is said to have a big O of 1, which is known as constant time. But say we had a function with two operations, like this one where we input a number, multiply it by 4, and save it to a variable called total, then return total times 3. So we have two multiplications in this function. Now we wouldn't say this function has a big O of 2, it'd still just be a big O of 1, because we're looking at the big picture. One operation isn't going to take significantly longer than 2 for a computer, so we can just ignore it. No matter what we put in, the number of operations won't increase in this function, it's constant time. Now is a good time to introduce the big O notation graph. Focus your attention on the green line, which represents a big O of 1, and the two functions we've just looked at. You can clearly see as we increase the input size, the time taken to compute does not increase. It remains constant. This is not the case for other big O's, which increase in computation time as we increase the input size. A big O of 1 is as good as it gets for algorithms. It's like algorithm paradise. But many times we can't achieve this. So let's take a look at an algorithm with a big O of n. Here we have a function called reverse array, which loops over the input array starting at the last item and builds up a new array which ends up being the input array reversed. If we input an array of the elements 1, 2, 3, then it returns 3, 2, 1. If we import 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it returns 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now which of these do you think will take longer to compute? If we input an array 3 items long, or an array 6 items long? This time you are correct if you said the longer array of six elements. And that is because in this algorithm, we're looping over each element in the array and then pushing that element onto a new array. So that's two extra operations for every extra element we have in the array. So if we pass in the array of three elements, there'll be six operations in total. If we pass in the array of six elements, there'll be 12 operations. If we double the length of the array, we double the number of operations. Now this technically has a big O of 2n, where n is the length of the input, but remember, big O looks at the big picture, the worst case scenario, where the input size approaches infinity. If we pass in an array infinity items long, then here, there will be 2 times infinity operations. 2 times infinity is still just infinity, it's just a very, very big number. So we can just ignore the 2 because, in the grand scheme of things, that 2 isn't all that significant. So we can describe this function as having a big O of n, which is known as linear time complexity. Coming back to our graph, we can see the blue line representing a linear relationship between input size and time, or number of operations if you will. Usually an algorithm with linear time is decent. In most cases it will be absolutely fine. Whilst not as efficient as constant time, the green line we discussed before, it is often the best we can do, and it's a lot better than a big O of n squared, which we'll look at next. So here's a function called multiply all, which accepts two arrays. It first makes sure that they're of equal length. If they are, then it will continue down and multiply every number in the first array with every number in the second array, and return the sum of all these products. It does this using two for loops. Now the first for loop loops over the first array, then inside this for loop we have a second nested loop, which loops over every item in the second array. So for every item we loop over in the first array, we have to loop over every item in the second array. If we pass in two arrays of length 2, then for the first run through the outer loop, ri will be 1. It will then loop through the second array, starting with 5, 
and 1 times 5 will be added to the total. It will then go to the second element in the second array and do 1 times 6 and add it to the total. Then we get to the end of that loop, go back to the outer loop and increment to the second element which is 2. We then do 2 times 5 and add it to the total, then finally 2 times 6 and add it to the total. As we can see, for every item in the first array, we have to loop over every single item in the second array and perform a multiplication. So the total number of operations will be the length of the first array, which is n, times the length of the second array, which is also n, because we check to make sure that they are of equal length. This results in a big O of n squared, aka quadratic time. If you are incredibly astute, you may have noticed that technically this algorithm would have a big O of 3n squared, because for every item in array 1, we loop over every item in array 2, which gives us n squared operations. We then also multiply two numbers, another n squared, and add to the total, another n squared, resulting in n squared plus n squared plus n squared, which equals 3n squared. But remember again, with big O notation, we're looking at the big picture, the worst case scenario as the input length approaches infinity, and 3 times infinity is still infinity, a humongous number. So as the input size grows, this 3 becomes insignificant in the grand scheme of things, and we simplify to say that this algorithm has a big O of n squared, aka quadratic time complexity. Back to our big O graph and looking at the red line representing quadratic time, we can see that as the input size increases, the number of operations grow at an ever increasing rate. The gradient or steepness of this line becomes steeper and steeper as we increase the input size. With small input size this is no big deal, as we can see all the big O's will result in similar completion times. You could just choose the algorithm that was the easiest to read or understand, but as the input size grows the efficiency of the algorithm can become critical to the runtime of the program. This is where it's important to understand the big O of your algorithms. Let's talk through a scenario. Say you need to pull in some data from an API or database. An array of 1000 users comes back to you, and now you need to sort this array into alphabetical order, e.g. Adam, Andrew, Becky, etc. If we use a sorting algorithm with a linear time, a big O of n, where n is the input size, then there will be around 1000 operations. But if you use a sorting algorithm with a big O of n squared, then there will be roughly 1000 times 1000 operations, that's 1 million operations, that's 999,000 more operations just because you used a bad algorithm at an inappropriate time. This is why it's quite important to understand big O notation. But what about built-in methods? So far we've only looked at custom functions, but it's important to realize that big O also applies to built-in JavaScript functions, such as the array methods push, pop, unshift and shift. Here we have a four item array. If we push five onto the end of this array, then all we have to do is create a new place at the end of the array, give it an index and put the value of five there. It doesn't matter what the length of the array is, it will always be constant time, a big O of 1. But say we want to add 0 to the front of the array with unshift 0, we'd have to re-index every item in the array, as the first index would now point to our newly added value. We'd have to add 1 to every index in the array, as the old first item is now the second, and so on. So unshifting and shifting have linear time complexities, a big O of n, because the longer the input array, the more items have to be re-indexed. In this video I've tried to keep things simple and not discuss logarithmic big O's, but big O's of log n and n log n are pretty common too. I just didn't include them in this video because I imagine that most people will have forgotten about logarithms since college or high school, and I didn't really want to turn this into too much of a boring math lecture, but yeah, logarithms exist, and I will leave it up to you to research further into logs, but honestly, they aren't difficult to understand, so it's probably worth watching a YouTube video on them. So that's it from me. I hope this video was helpful and not too confusing. Please leave me a comment, as I'd love to hear your thoughts. Give me a like, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. It'd really help me out. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.